All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Alan Levy, and I'm the uh, chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Miami. And I'd like to uh, invite or welcome everybody to the University of Miami uh, Neurosurgery uh, Virtual Sub-Eye. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the program, uh, and then uh, my colleagues uh, will follow in sequence. Uh, talking about uh, the, the different aspects of the program, including the different divisions. Uh, and then we'll finish off with Dr. Uh, Komatar, who's our program director, and have uh, a QA. and a uh, You'll also hear from uh, the residents uh, of the program. Um, so the Department of Neurosurgery has a, a really rich history. Um, it's probably not as old as some of the programs in the Northeast, but UM Medical School started in 1924. Um, the first neurosurgery program in the state of Florida was that of the University of Miami. Um, the uh, Miami Project started in 1985, which you'll learn is one of the big research arms of the program. Uh, it, it continued to, to grow over time and is now one of the largest uh, uh, neurosurgery programs in the country. Uh, centered around uh, two main adult hospitals, uh, the University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital. Um, if you want to read more about the history of the program, uh, there was a publication in 2017 uh, that goes into the details. I, I would argue we have the best uh, faculty uh, in the country. Uh, uh, some of the top names that you will see uh, in neurosurgery uh, work at the University of uh, Miami, and we'll get into a little bit more uh, of the details, but we have uh, essentially 20 faculty. Um, and when you look at some of the strengths of the program is that the faculty have often trained in different residency programs. So this is a map of the United States, and here we have labeled uh, where some of our faculty did their residency. And you can see it really covers the map of the US, uh, Canada, and outside of North America. Um, and that uh, allows different views of how to, uh, how to do things. There are some programs in the country that just hire their own residents. Uh, and I think it becomes very um, uh, univision, so to speak. Uh, so we, we, you will get a vast and different experience. Another strength of the program is simply the location of the main uh, hospitals and, uh, and research labs. So uh, the uh, people who get into the program, residents who get into the program, uh, our, our main area where we congregate from an academic point of view is the Lois Pope Life Center. And you can see that in, in where it is in, this, uh, in the medical center. Uh, it's a building that has the administrative offices, but six floors of labs and our um, conference center. Um, and then the University of Miami Hospital is across the street. It's a large academic hospital, uh, and you'll hear more about it, but co covers the gamut of neurosurgery. Uh, and then uh, kitty corner to that is Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is our county hospital, and it's a large trauma center. It has the pediatric Holtz uh, hospital uh, within it. And again, it's within walking distance of the other hospitals. And then our VA hospital uh, is across the street from that. And it's again, one of our uh, busy uh, adult hospitals that the, the residents rotate in. So you can see how close everything is to each other. And then finally, we are super excited about the opening in um, this year um, of the Lynn Rehabilitation Center, uh, which is uh, part of UM Jackson and where a lot of our uh, patients uh, will go uh, after longer surgeries or trauma. And then finally, we have Nicholas Children's Hospital uh, that's just 10 miles to the south uh, where uh, most of the pediatric neurosurgery takes place. Again, uh, this next slide is on geography and, and, and really trying to speak about how geographically privileged we are in this program. So this is a map of the US showing that Florida has 21.5 million residents. It's now the third most populous state in the US um, and it's only growing. 
Uh, and this is a, a map of Florida showing the four uh, main uh, neurosurgery residency training programs, which are Mayo, UF, USF, and us. And you can see we're in South Florida and that uh, we have uh, the five most populous counties right around us. So it's a, a great source for drawing patients. Uh, the state of Florida itself only has four training programs. New York has 12 training programs and it has uh, less population. And you can see just uh, by location that we are the pathway to, from, uh, to the states from the Caribbean and South America. Hence, we see a lot of international patients through that route. Some other statistics were the fifth largest U.S. medical center. Um, Ryder Trauma Center is a level one uh, trauma center. Uh, UM Neurosurgery is highly ranked in U.S. News and World. Miami Children's is ranked number 13 in U.S. News and World. N neurosurgery is ranked uh, number 10 in Blue Ridge um, NIH funding. And we're uh, ranked about number 10 in neurosurgical departmental academic productivity. Uh, in terms of operative numbers, it's a very busy operative program. You'll hear more about it, uh, but we do over 5,000 cases a year, and that number has been growing from year to year. Um, we have uh, terrific physician extenders in all of our hospitals, and this is a, a pictorial of some of our PAs and our nurses who helped in the different hospitals that take some of the scut work, so to speak, uh, from the residents so they can focus on clinical activities, including clinic and um, surgery, uh, and not necessarily take as much of the scut work that might be on the floor. I'll just briefly talk about the various divisions. We have a, a large brain tumor program, really one of the busiest in the country, and you can see the number of brain tumor cases has been escalating year after year. Uh, the UMBTI, or Brain Tumor Initiative, um, is a big part of that, and it includes both clinical uh, and basic science research, and you'll be hearing more about that. Uh, we have a terrific vascular and skull place program led by Dr. Jacques Marcos uh, with a high volume of very complicated cases and a terrific uh, collaboration uh, with uh, many of our ENT skull based surgeons. And uh, we're very proud of the opening uh, two years ago of our skull-based laboratory, which is located in the medical school on the eighth floor, where there are uh, 12 working stations with uh, a terrific uh, microscopy. Uh, and we've had a number of different teaching uh, sessions, both in cranial and spine and peripheral nerve uh, in, this, in this area. Uh, a great way to practice your uh, skills before you get into the operating room. It's called the Keynes Lab. Um, a phenomenal endovascular program, which you'll hear about uh, from Dr. Peterson, uh, includes Dr. Peterson, Stark, and Yavagal uh, doing some of the most complicated uh, endovascular uh, procedures and some of the most cutting edge endovascular procedures. Uh, you'll hear from Dr. Wang, who leads our spine program. Uh, again, one of the busiest spine programs in the country and, and incredibly innovative. Uh, with uh, you, you, where you learn the latest surgical techniques. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jagged runs the uh, functional program. Dr. Ivan uh, also is very involved in the epilepsy program. So that is also very well represented in the program. We have a very strong peripheral nerve uh, surgery program uh, led uh, by myself and Dr. Cote uh, and, and soon uh, to take on uh, one of our uh, residents to help with that effort. Um, we have a fantastic neurotrauma critical care program uh, that is uh, run by Dr. O'Phelan. Uh, and we do see a lot of trauma, both at the, our level one Rider Trauma Center, but also uh, down at Jackson uh, South, which is a level two uh, trauma center. Uh, you'll hear from Dr. Ragab about the pediatric neurosurgery program that's run primarily out of Miami Children's, uh, but also at, uh, at Holtz uh, Children's Hospital. Uh, and again, because of uh, volume and expertise, uh, sees a, a terrific uh, number of pathologies. Um, the, the academic uh, profile of the program has uh, increased exponentially over the years as measured by the number of resident publications uh, and uh, papers that have focused 
on things like age index of the, of, of the people who are writing out of the program. It, it is always difficult to do research and if you can make it easier in any way, uh, you will be more successful. Uh, and we have uh, a terrific uh, amount of regulatory support uh, for uh, things like IRB submissions, IACUC submissions, uh, and dealing with all of the paperwork that goes along uh, with research. Um, and we have excellent publications uh, support, uh, both from uh, Linda and uh, Roberto Suazo, uh, who helps uh, with our graphics and does many, many, many things uh, to help uh, the program uh, move forward in that realm. Uh, these are just some pictures of front page publications uh, that have happened over the last six or seven years. Uh, as, as time goes on, I don't actually have room uh, for all of the front covers uh, from, from members of the department. Um, and a, a lot of these, or all of these, were, were helped by uh, Roberto Suazo. Um, I'll talk a little bit about research. Dr. Dietrich is the scientific director of the Miami Project. The Miami Project's been around for 35 years. Uh, it's focused on spinal cord injury, but it, there's lots of research going on in all aspects of neurotrauma, uh, even uh, areas such as MS. Uh, and here are the members of the faculty uh, of the Miami Project. Uh, the terrific thing about it is it's basic scientists, but you'll see a, a number of our clinicians are incredibly involved in the Miami Project, doing both basic science and clinical research. And we have uh, burgeoning uh, programs uh, as part of the University of Miami Brain Tumor Initiative and, and uh, a very strong cerebrovascular research program um, led by Dr. Stark, and you'll hear uh, more about that as well. Um, this is our ranking in NIH funding and some of our uh, faculty and basic science who have research grants uh, that, uh, that are NIH funded. Um, and uh, something that we're really proud of is the R25 research program, which is an uh, endeavor by the NIH to fund uh, specifically neurosurgery and neurology programs uh, so that residents can get a minimum of one year of NIH-based funding uh, during their residency. Uh, and again, it's a terrific uh, part uh, of this program. Um, the residents are often, obviously, the heart and soul of the program, uh, and, and you'll hear the resident's perspective as well. Uh, but it, it is uh, so important. We feel it's very important that they're nurtured, taken well care of, um, and uh, Ingrid uh, uh, and Menendez and uh, Aziz Anam, who's uh, coming on, uh, do a, a, a great part in, in, in helping uh, to make their life uh, a little easier. Um, and we obviously are very collaborative. We like to play hard and work hard. Uh, and, and this is just uh, 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 one microcosm of the play hard part of it. Dr. Komatar started the uh, New York Charity Softball Tournament uh, back almost 20 years ago, and we've par participated in that since 2010 uh, and uh, have been uh, successful in winning it uh, twice. So that is sort of an overview of the entire program. Um, I wanted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Wang, who's the, the Chief of Neurosurgery at the University of Miami Hospital. He's the Division Chief for Spine, as well as the Spine Fellowship Director. Uh, again, nice uh, speaking with you, and I hope you uh, consider the University of Miami as a potential neurosurgical training program. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. I just want to echo all those great comments, and I apologize that you guys are in this situation where uh, we're unable to, how do you say, see you personally, and we look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, sub eyes are such an integral part of this whole process, but I do want to congratulate you guys on choosing the most interesting and exciting specialty, and I'm not at all biased about that. Um, this, this is a wonderful place to train. Uh, I trained at USC and, and did my fellowship here with Dr. Levy and Dr. Green. I came back uh, to work uh, here because it's such a wonderful and collegial environment. So let me just start by saying that I'll just talk about spine, and when I was in your shoes, I thought that this is what I'd be doing. All manner of... Um, 
of, if you will, brain surgeries. And the reality is that uh, for the last, uh, going on 20 years, I've basically only been doing spine. And spine has so many different interesting facets at your home medical school. Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. This is, as Dr. Levy said, uh, one of the largest spine centers in the world. And there, there is a reason for that. Everybody will make claims to you, right? Because they want you to rank them highly and, and attend uh, their programs. We actually have a very strong legacy of spine leadership. The approximate three chairs of neurosurgery are spinal surgeons, and the approximate two chairs of orthopedics are spinal surgeons. So we're very collaborative, and we have a great relationship uh, with them. So in spine, there are so many uh, elements uh, to look at, whether it be, as you know, degenerative diseases, but also infection, trauma, neoplasia, and deformity. And you may not think too much about this stuff now, but understand that 70% of all neurosurgical practice in, in America, anyhow, is spine. So 70% of all the cases of all the specialists are spine surgeons in the world. So of course, it's absolutely essential wherever you go, whether you choose to be a spine specialist or not, that you get adequate training in this type of uh, disease process. And if you look at what we do, whereas all the spine faculty here can basically do any spine case, we have ourselves super subspecialized into areas that we have tremendous interest in, in terms of research and clinical mm -hmm. practice. And, uh, and if you have questions about that, feel free to engage any of these attendings because it is really uh, quite interesting to get into. As far as the service lines, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, three main areas will be Jackson, uh, University of Miami Hospital, and I should put the VA here. The VA hospital is now being run by uh, Timur Yurikov and Ram Benvenista. They are doing a fantastic job to get you uh, the kind of spine experience you need at that facility as well. This gives you some concept of volume now. I know wherever you go, people are going to talk about how busy they are, but let me just say that at our hospital system, uh, just on the main campus, we'll be running up to 15 or 17 rooms a day for first starts. The uh, volume that occurs at this institution uh, will challenge or rival any institution in the country. Uh, probably only centers in China could do bigger volumes than what we do. And whether that be in terms of consultations for the emergency room, the operative cases, or uh, clinic volume. So all of those are absolutely critical. And of course, that's what you want as a resident. You want not only the clinical experience, but also the substrate with which to write papers and do research and to get fully trained across the breadth of uh, pathologies. And we will be the first center in the world soon to have all three spine robots, the first center in the world. I'll just emphasize that uh, for, for emphasis, if you will. And I'm gonna spare you the stuff that you can find on PubMed, all that's published. Dr. Levy covered it nicely. I think the opportunities here are literally limitless. Ian Kajigas has been running the research um, arm for the medical students. And I, I wanna say that Ian's got uh, over 40, maybe 50 of the UM medical students working now in our department, which is absolutely, when you think about it, a phenomenal uh, penetration for a relatively medium-sized uh, medical school. This shows uh, how this lays out in terms of what you would be doing in terms of residents, fellows, and nurse practitioners. You can see, just like Dr. Levy said, there's a lot of nurse practitioner support to handle uh, patient care. A lot of, as he said, the scut work. They're wonderful, delightful people. They don't compete with you at all in terms of educational content. They don't really come to the operating room, which is, which is good for all of you. And if you think about what's interesting, so spine here is not just an economic engine. It's not just something to pay the bills. If you talk about interesting, uh, cutting edge aspects of spine, all the faculty are involved in these various elements giving, of course, you not only the expert training you need for when you finish, but also to pique your curiosity if you want to specialize in the area or publish or become well-known around the world. Because we know that you guys are the future. I'm quite old myself now. You guys will be bearing the torch for the future of neurosurgery. So in summary, I say spine care and spine surgery is a major UM service line. This reflects the local population, which is the elderly population, as well as the very unique institutional history at UM. It's only made possible with the infrastructure, as Dr. Levy indicated, and we are definitely accelerating to the future. And these are just some pictures from our service line showing how this is really a very, very collaborative place. People like to get together socially, and it's not just a place to work, it's a place where we treat uh, others as family. 
I'm going to put a shameless plug in for our nurse review podcast. We've had on uh, Dr. Levy twice, Dr. Komatar twice, Dr. Green, Dr. Ragab, Dr. Stark, and many others. So if you want to know what's going on here, that's another angle with which to approach it. So I do want to thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, thank you for uh, your interest level. Please do not be shy. Please type into the Q&A or chat sessions uh, so that we can answer uh, live with you as well. Okay, hi, uh, Jacques Morcos here, can you hear me? You can hear my, okay, great. I will talk to you about the skull base program and again, welcome as well as the open cerebrovascular program. Uh, as you've, you're gonna hear repeatedly, we are indeed a high volume tertiary referral center regionally, nationally, Latin America and internationally for cerebrovascular and the skull based diseases among all the other specialties you've heard about. We have an, indeed a very firm commitment to clinical research and educational missions. You can see beautiful Miami there in your top left and our medical complex. Um, skull base and open vascular, you can see is a symbiosis. Now, of course, as you will see in a minute, some of us are interested in skull base only, some of us in open vascular, and you will hear a lot about our spectacular endovascular. I would just focus on the open vascular. You can see all the subspecialties that you have to interface with. Uh, stroke neurology, endovascular on the CV end, in skull base, ENT, oculoplastic, neuroophthalmology, neuroendocrinology, and radiation oncology. And as I will show you, we are blessed with excellence all around this, uh, this program. It is indeed a symbiotic, not a parasitic relationship. Where does the open CV and skull base intersect? Just to give you some examples, where does CV help? Skull base is, for example, balloon test occlusion of the carotid artery, pre-op tumor embolization, intra-op repair, bypass of injured arteries and veins during tumor resection, microvascular skills in dissecting, manipulating, and respecting the brain. The other way around as well, skull base helps open vascular in appreciation of the anatomy, in designing the approaches, and it's a toolbox. So you will find, to be honest, very few programs that can offer you excellence in those two sub-disciplines. And that's very important for you if eventually you'll be interested in that field. Uh, whether you want to do a brainstem cavernoma, which is a vascular case, you need to understand the skull-based approaches for it. In this case, for example, the far lateral approach or whether you're going to use a skull base approach to approach a complex vascular lesion such as this basilar aneurysm or deal with the carotid artery at the base of a tumor or exenterate a cavernous sinus so the having expertise in both and having people who can deal with both things very important talking about the people of course what makes this place uh, are the people, as you will hear about. I'll introduce myself first. I'm director of cerebrovascular and skull base surgery. And what do I think I bring to this program? And I've been here 25 years. And any program you choose to go to, of course, the faculty needs to be able to open up the doors for you for organized neurosurgery, if that's you're interested in, or other avenues. So I've been chair or past president of the CV section, the North American Skull Base Society, the Sun, I'm intimately involved with WANS, the WFNS, and uh, the Skull Base Cast Force, a task force for Skull Base, and that's gonna be a new initiative. So I'm quite uh, very embedded in organized neurosurgery, and of course, I try to get our own residents and fellows and junior faculty uh, uh, involved in these programs if they are uh, interested. For the open cerebrovascular program, well, there are three of us besides myself. You will see Eric Peterson and Bobby Stark in a second. Uh, I am not an endovascular person, but they both are duly trained for open and endovascular. And we have an endovascular neurologist you will hear about later Deli Piavagal and eight stroke neurologist. Uh, we, I am I'm so happy and delighted to have these two folks as my partners and we, you're gonna hear about them in a second. Uh, uh, Bobby trained at UVA 
and has been with us for about three years and is uh, director of endovascular research. And Eric has been with us several years, having trained at, uh, in Washington, in Seattle, and uh, runs the endovascular program here. And again, you're going to hear from them. But uh, the nice thing is that they're duly trained and can do open or endovascular. Uh, the skull base program is huge. Uh, three neurosurgeons, five neuroautologists, nine head and neck surgeons, three rhinologists, six oculoplastic surgeons, four neuroophthalmologists, endocrinology, radiation oncology, neuroradiology, and neuropathology. Um, first, let me start with neurosurgery. Mike Ivan, who's been here five years, is a phenomenal. A surgeon who is not only going to introduce for you the brain tumor program after me, but is also a quintessential skull-based surgeon and also has interest in epilepsy surgery. Mike and I have been doing the skull-based surgery for the last several years together. He also is director of the research at the UM brain, uh, UMBTI you've heard about uh, a second ago. He trained at UCSF, did a fellowship with Rick Komotar, and we recognized his brilliance, and we thought he should join us, and I'm glad he did. Within the last year, Carolina Benjamin joined us from NYU. Carolina did a fellowship with uh, Chandra Sen, six months in skull base, and then six months radio surgery with Doug Gonziolka. Uh, Carolina is helping us with the Jackson North program, but also has an interest in skull-based surgery, and we, uh, she is director of that Keynes lab that you just saw, and I'm gonna show you again. I cannot talk about skull-based surgery without talking about those disciplines we just talked about. This is a huge ENT department. You can see how many faculty they have there, and uh, we intersect with almost all of them. Uh, they do have an ENT in one of the busiest programs in ENT with north of 5,000 cases a year. And I'm just going to show you the pictures. And we, of course, all know them by first name, last name. We work with these people day in, day out. This is head and neck surgery. This is neuroautology. This is rhinology. This is endoscopic skull base program, of course, which is possible because of the uh, of a collaboration with rhinology and several of us in neurosurgery who do pituitary and, and other skull base work from a rhinological point of view. Uh, I'd like to remind you that part of the University of Miami is Baskin Palmer Eye Institute and phenomenally has been number one uh, a hospital in ophthalmology in the US, I believe 17 years in a row. This is again, not surprisingly, uh, their last uh, award here. Uh, and we work intimately with neuroophthalmology, those are the four forks in neuroophthalmology we work with, oculoplastic surgery, and I'm only putting the pictures of the people who actually work with us in neurosurgery. There are many more that may not interact with us. Neuroendocrinology, two phenomenal people, uh, Atil Karji and Alejandro Ayala for our pituitary program, and these are the radiation oncologists who work intimately uh, with us for gamma knife and hyper arc uh, radio surgery. Our skull base program is only one of 16 that gets the highly coveted team honor roll from the North American Skull Base Society. Uh, and uh, you can see us there with uh, in the presence of other programs. That's this year. Conferences. Well, there are lots of conferences. There are weekly well, pre-COVID times, and we still continue to do that, every Tuesday morning, uh, my endovascular colleagues, mostly Bobby Stark, runs a vascular conference, seven to eight. Uh, and in the evening, we have, I'll tell you about it in a second, what I've uh, called MOBS, Multidisciplinary of the Base of the Skull Conference, for two hours. Now, since uh, COVID hit, Mike Ivan had the brilliant idea of starting a virtual symposium that has picked up steam. He started it in April and called it the, the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. I picked up his idea and started a cerebrovascular skull-based symposium on Thursdays. And I uh, encourage you, if you haven't seen one of the Wednesday or Thursday symposium, we do it every week. 
with uh, fantastic speakers. And uh, we're, uh, we, we have many months ahead of us of planning and programming. Uh, I'd like to talk about MOBS, the multi-specialist of the base of the Skull Conference. I started it about 10 years ago. This was in, in 2011 when we celebrated our first year. And I honestly don't think there is anything like it in any neurosurgical program around the country, not to the extent that we have. Look at the number of people who attend, uh, look at the subspecialties that come to the table, and you will see the fertile ground for research, for discussion of complex skull-based cases and planning the treatment. And so many projects have come out of this weekly two-hour uh, conference with the input of all these uh, fantastic uh, people. Uh, this is, for example, the Wednesday, Mike Ivan's Wednesday symposium next week will be for, uh, you, you can see Juan Carlos from Stanford will be talking. The next Thursday, the one uh, I'm running will be, for example, Shekhar and Ramina talking about cavernous sinus surgery. And that's a program for the coming Thursday uh, uh, programming. Education, Kane's lab. Again, I'd like to reiterate how delighted we were that this cadaveric lab opened up uh, two years ago. Uh, it, it can be expanded into this MISTI lab for large conferences. Otherwise, those 12 stations you saw are available to you, future residents, fellows, and so forth. Uh, some of the courses that run there, beautiful surgical instruments. Actually, we purchased brand new. Uh, they're honestly almost better than some of our operating room instruments. They're spectacular. Uh, clinical, I don't want to waste your time telling you how many numbers and how many volumes. We're extremely busy. Uh, several hundred cases, each of us, in skull base, open vascular, in skull base, every endoscopic or open complex skull base approach you can think of, we do in large quantity. There is no single uh, clinical uh, surgical approach you can think of that we do not do here. We work together, multiple teams. Uh, radio surgery, gamma knife, and hyper arc. I will talk about some innovations in research in a second that particularly my partner Mike Ivan uh, is doing. Open vascular. This is probably one of the few centers that still does advanced open uh, cerebrovascular surgery, be it complex aneurysm clipping, uh, uh, bypass surgery. I, I do about 35 of those a year as the several centers uh, do less and less of this, complex brainstem cavernomas, AVMs, and so forth. We really do have a very balanced uh, approach to the whole cerebrovascular field, as you will hear from my endovascular colleagues. Uh, we have, of course, lots of experience, acoustic neuromas, cavernous sinus tumors, clival chordomas, Petrosal approaches for petroclival meningiomas. Mike Ivan just two days ago did a very nice Kawazi approach, for example, for a cavernoma. You know, many of these things are almost rarities uh, in, other, in other programs. To us, these things are weekly routines. Uh, we still, uh, I still clip the occasional basilar tip aneurysm. So, of course, that, for example, that volume has appropriately dropped down, but we still do some complex clippings that uh, you may not see at all in other programs. Uh, AVMs, um, uh, very proud of our bypass experience for Moya Moya, ischemia, and others. Research, I'd like to, uh, I, I can talk a lot about that, but really I'd like to highlight the vestibular schwannoma research program, and that's mostly uh, uh, to Mike Ivan and his colleague, uh, Christine Din from Neuroautology, the TAC team, and they're doing beautiful basic science work in this as well as clinical work. And this is some of the product of this clinical work. And actually Christine received the award from the North American Skull Base Society along with Mike to continue uh, this work. Again, you can check this out uh, online. Um, and that's that group. Some other recent projects, we've shown endoscopic and open resection of anterior skull base meningioma, work of Stephanie Chen, one of, of our fantastic residents. We put the University of Miami and UPMC series together, uh, about to be published, 
Angela Richardson, our Finnish finishing chief resident, looked at large and giant acoustic neuromas. Uh, she also put together, is putting together ischemia moya moya bypass study. Uh, Mike and Ron Benveniste have started the DIAMOC study for CSF leaks. Mike is interested in atypical uh, grade two meningiomas, and I can go on and go on. Carolina, who joined us, has many interesting ideas to start as well as build on what she's done at NYU on the work on Cordoma of uh, Chandra Sen and her uh, interest in radio surgery as, as well. Uh, lastly, uh, I'm very proud of the fellowship we have in combined skull base and open vascular. And to be these, I'm very proud of those people. Uh, I and others have trained over the years. The numbers you can see in the top left is the year of their training, starting with Nikita back in 1996. Yearly, we take one fellow. I am sure you recognize uh, faces and names because they are leaders in other programs that you may be visiting. Uh, uh, finishing up with Samir Sur, who's going to uh, Georgetown, uh, who just finished his fellowship with us here. Um, and the question whether a fellow interferes with residency training, talk to our resident, and you will absolutely see that it is an integral part. It's enriching to both uh, parties. It does not interfere at all with anybody's tra training. As a matter of fact, it reinforces both. It's a win-win situation. And uh, we're booked several years in advance getting fellows. And to be honest, it is, uh, this fellowship is only one of three in the country that offers combined open vascular and skull base. Uh, there are, of course, many skull-based fellowships. There are many open vascular, but this combination, there are only three, and I firmly believe ours is absolutely the best. Uh, what makes our program special? Volume and complexity of clinical cases, talent and expertise of varied faculty of different ranks, recognized internationally, extent of collaboration with other disciplines seen absolutely nowhere else, but mostly our current residents, their drive, their passion, their competence, their esprit de corps is second to none in this, in this country. If, there, if I've left anything undiscussed, feel free to email me. Uh, and I am new to Twitter, so here's my Twitter handle, still trying to learn the ropes and try to figure out what Instagram even means. Thank you for your attention. Oh, I'd like to now introduce Mike Ivan, who I am delighted to see will now uh, talk about uh, the Brain Tumor Program. Uh, Mike, all yours. Thank you so much, Jacques. Uh, that was a great presentation. And, and, and thus far, it's always, it's always impressive to learn uh, about all the areas of our department every year as we do this. And, uh, you know, the Brain Tumor Program we'll talk about uh, next. And, and just like all the other programs, I have to say that uh, and I'm obviously biased that I think our brain tumor program is, is, is by far one of the best in the country and, and for many reasons. Um, and the first reason is that, uh, and it just introduce myself again, if, if you didn't catch it already, uh, Mike Ivan, I'm one of the brain tumor skull base and epilepsy surgeons and also um, the director of research for our brain tumor program. So uh, it, it all starts with our faculty. Uh, and I think Dr. Morcos already talked about uh, a bunch. But uh, just to kind of complete the faculty, I mean, uh, we have legends in our department and um, people that would, uh, you know, be chairman in many places. Uh, and then I'll start with, with the first page here. We have Dr. Hiros, who's uh, really been uh, one of the, the grandfathers of Skull Base, uh, wrote the first paper about far laterals and, and continues to be active in our, our neurosurgery residency program. And that he's there every morning for us uh, discussing complex uh, brain tumor, skull base, and vascular cases. Uh, for an hour with the residents, uh, and the, the resource is just invaluable. And, and what that's done is that it also brings the rest of the faculty, the fellows, the residents all together every morning to have these uh, discussions and debates that are really critical for the decision making that you need to do uh, both as a resident and in your career. Uh, Dr. Marcos, obviously, uh, you know, he said so much already, and he's just a, a world renowned and legend uh, cerebrovascular skull based surgeon. I mean, there's really things that we're doing here in the skull waste world that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the world. And, and we thank him for, for being here and being such a great educator and, and running the program for us. Dr. Landy has also been here for more than 25 years uh, running our uh, radiation and stereotactic radiation program where we have a, 
a very large volume of cases that go through Gamma Knife um, and Linux. Um, and he is, uh, supervises all that in the education for the residents. Uh, we also have Dr. Komatar, who you've heard from already. Uh, he's a professor and program director uh, and director of the of UMBTI. Uh, extremely, extremely high case volume, doing over 700, 750 cases a, a year, um, and, and just an outstanding educator for the residents. He's won um, the, the Educator Award multiple times. Um, uh, Dr. Ben Veniste he operates at the VA in Jackson Hospital. Uh, brain tumor specialist and, and just actually, uh, you know, absolutely pleasant to work with. Uh, and Dr. Benjamin, who's one of our newest recruits, as Dr. Morco said, brain tumor and skull based specialist. And I think what's important about this group is that we, we all have a different background um, and that, you know, just looking at this page, you know, Rick trained at Columbia and, and then did a fellowship at Sloan Kettering. Ron was at Mount Sinai and then did a, a, the MD Anderson fellowship. Carolina is uh, trained at NYU and then stayed on for an NYU fellowship. And then I, I trained at UCSF and did a fellowship here at Miami. And I think that that, that uh, difference of background is huge in a program because the residents really get to pick and choose um, uh, and understand that there are different approaches uh, to, to attack, especially brain tumors. You know, every brain tumor is different and everything is a, is a different puzzle that you have to approach in a different way. And unless you hear from different perspectives and different ideas, it's hard for you to really understand the positive and negatives. And so we hope that as you go through the program, you get to pick uh, really the, the, the pluses of each one of us and to make you the summation of all of our good points and not our bad points. And so that when you graduate, you should be better than any of us that are training with you. Uh, so as stated before, I mean, the clinical volume here in Miami is just is just um, unremarkable, uh, the, especially with the brain tumor program. Our, our numbers of surgeries continue to rise each year. We're now consistently over a thousand a year of brain tumors, which is puts us in the top five of, uh, as far as clinically heavy volume uh, centers for brain tumors in the country. Uh, and that really is, as Dr. Levy said in the beginning, due to the location in our large catch valley. Not only is it the most densely part of Florida, and we, we capture all of South Florida, but we're getting the Bahamas, U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Latin America, uh, and, and South America, uh, of the most advanced cases that they're not able to treat down there come to us. So just looking last week, you know, I looked at, uh, at the team of brain tumor surgeons. Uh, even with the COVID crisis going on, we had 24 brain tumor surgeries last week at just University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Hospital. I didn't look at everybody's films, but just in, in my clinic and in my cases in the last two weeks, uh, you know, do, these are just some of the pathologies that I've seen in the last two weeks, um, you know, ranging from skull base to uh, large uh, deep glioblastoma cases, huge giant pituitary tumors, fibrous dysplasia involving the entire skull base, uh, um, and the black sac tumors. I mean, these are just things that you, you see maybe once a year in other places, and, and, and this is just what we're seeing on a weekly basis, as Dr. Morcos has said, and, and, and the, you know, the gliomas as well. And you know, learning by sheer numbers is, is really important, especially in residency. I'm a firm believer that it's better to, to see a lot uh, to know more than rather than just to see one of those cases and read a lot about it. That's just particularly how I learned, especially as a resident. Uh, and so if you're like that, this is, this is definitely the program for you. Obviously, just as the, the skull-based department, the Brain Tumor Program is a multidisciplinary organization, and it really uh, leads with the Cancer Center. So the Cancer Center, uh, uh, Sylvester, just was named uh, NCI designated. And so what does that mean? Well, it means it's one of uh, 100 uh, cancer centers in the country that have that designation by the NIH. It allows us to have additional funding for research, allows us to be a part of more national uh, clinical trials, and as well as, as national rec reputation. There's a lot of key elements that go into being an NCI Cancer Center, and we've obviously been able to check the boxes on all of those. So they have a tremendous amount of support for our brain tumor program, as well as all the other departments that are involved um, that I'll talk about um, uh, next. We do brain tumor surgery at, at all the hospitals. So University of Miami Hospital, Jackson Hospital, Jackson South, uh, the VA, and even now we're starting to do brain tumor surgery at Jackson North. And so there, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. If you want to learn more, you could obviously, we have a, a website at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, website. It's under the University of Miami Brain Tumor Initiative. The web address is above. You know, the, the top three successes that we talk about, as I already said, was the fact that we're so busy, national rep reputation. We have our own uh, neuro-oncology fellowship where we have um, two uh, fellows right now. We've had that for the last several years, brain tumor uh, fellows. One has 
In the last several years, we've had one enfolded fellowship, which I think we'll go over later when the residency program. So PGY four or five, which will do an enfolded fellowship. And then as a, we have one external fellow that comes in as a PGY eight uh, to do the fellowship. So we have two this year. They've been phenomenal. Um, the program's been going on now for uh, six years and uh, has been really helpful for both the residents and the fellows. Personally, as, as a, uh, being at a residency program that didn't have a lot of fellows, uh, and we started to get them as I was a chief resident. I was a little hesitant on the, on the advantage of fellows as being a resident in a nursery program, but I could tell you that both ex experiencing the transition from a program that went from no fellows to many fellows to now being in a program that has many fellows, there's nothing but advantages. Um, you know, the fellows are only there to, to kind of learn a different aspect of nursery than as a resident you are. They add to the educational and research components and they also bring in a different perspective um, from their program that you could help learn learn further. And then, uh, you know, we are a, a very uh, uh, kind of open-minded group to new technologies, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit further. So weekly, we have a neuro-oncology tumor board conference. Uh, as far as the just some of the team, we have two world-class neuropathologists that are dedicated to just our, our brain tumor program, and they have uh, actually uh, applied for a fellowship that we hope will be starting next year, where that will add to the research of the neuropathology. Department. We have three medical neuro-oncologists with a fourth one to be hired hopefully this summer. Uh, they also just started a neuro-oncology fellowship with the first uh, fellow starting this year. Five dedicated neuro-radiation oncologists. Our clinical trial portfolio is typically around 15. Um, and right now with the COVID crisis, it's down to 10 because there's been a lot of cut funding cuts over the last two months. Um, but we hopefully have that up to 15 again soon. Uh, I'll go through the brain tumor researchers at the end. We have a very large tumor bank where we collect all of our samples. And just a quick query, uh, yesterday I was able to look at uh, our publications and uh, the brain tumor team, uh, this is really much due to the residents and fellows and, and how much they're involved in our research, but uh, over 100 brain tumor publications from University of Miami in the last year, uh, which is just uh, remarkable and it shows you the opportunities that are available uh, and also kind of the streamlined ability that we have with so much support uh, to do research at University of Miami, that you're able to kind of really focus on the critical parts of these publications and you don't have to worry about all the, the formatting and the, uh, the references and things like that, which could be helped by somebody else. But when you have everybody around you doing research and publishing, this is something that you could accomplish. So uh, I'm not gonna go through all the clinical trials, but these are just the, the 10 that are open right now. They're also on the website if you wanna learn more about them, but they're all active. A lot of them are investigator initiated and, and we have residents involved and I'd say more than half of them. Um, as far as innovations that go along with brain tumor surgery, uh, you know, we cover all, the entire breadth of anything that you could think about with brain tumors. And I wouldn't say we just cover them, we're leading the way. So awake craniotomies, we do more than 250 awakes, uh, awake surgeries a year. Uh, minimally invasive brain tumor surgery I'll talk about, advanced neuroimaging and neuronavigation. So we just had a, a brand new MRI installed at University of Miami Hospital. Now not only can we do fMRI and DTI, but we could also do um, advanced uh, resting straight fMRI, uh, MRIs and um, uh, MR spectroscopy. And we're starting a new clinical trial on canoptomics with that uh, new MRI uh, by the end of the summer. Uh, endoscopy, uh, in neuroendoscopy, uh, so we have uh, six people that do pituitary surgery, and I'd say we're, we're just about uh, operating on over 200 uh, pituitary tumors a year. In addition to that, there's about another 75 uh, expanded intranasal surgeries that we do a year with the, the brain tumor and skull base team. 5 ALA for fluorescence guided tumor surgery is available, and as well as vaccine trials. Laser surgery and tubular retractor surgery, I'll talk about in a second, uh, and some of the other techniques as well. So, um, you know, as far as uh, some of the other research that we're kind of leading the way in, uh, and that's really with neuroimaging, we have a really strong uh, neuroradiology department, uh, specifically with uh, MR spectroscopy. We have a clinical trial where we're actually looking at the detection of 2-HG, so we can actually tell mutational status of gliomas uh, before we operate on them, as well as uh, looking at intratumor hemorrhagenicity, uh, one of only three programs in the country that could do 3D MR spectroscopy. And when I talk about leading um, the science or leading the way in new techniques in neurosurgery, we go beyond that. So laser surgery has been around for about five years and, uh, and we quickly took that up as a, as a new platform for treating brain tumors and have just published our, the largest ser single series of over 100 cases, it's now more than 150 cases, of brain tumors uh, that were treated with laser. 
So just an instance of, of how we try to adapt to new technology as, we, um, as it's available to us. Uh, minimally invasive tubular retractor series, we just published this uh, the other month. Again, longest, largest single, uh, largest series by university in that group. Um, pushing the way for supermaximal resection of gliomas, we take a very uh, aggressive approach. And these are just two um, articles here. One that got the cover uh, last month in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology talking about non-enhancing gliomas. And then uh, uh, we always look about improving efficiency. It's a great paper done by Angela, who just graduated, looking at how to discharge people uh, faster and more effectively, but yet safer in the way, uh, which is becoming now even more critical during the COVID crisis when we're pressed for ICU beds. Uh, so another instance uh, about research and, 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 trans and translational research with our brain tumor program. So we trialed a new imaging system last year in our program. Ashish Shah really took the lead as well as Dan Eichberg on um, looking at this system as soon as it came in. And within a week, we had a clinical trial going uh, to look at its efficiency and efficacy in brain tumor diagnosis uh, instantaneously in the operating room. That was uh, published in JNS last year. And that led to us being part of this large consortium where we use a system with artificial intelligence to detect uh, brain tumors uh, immediately within 30 seconds on sampling in the OR that was published at Nature thus last year. So just a great example of, of how the brain tumor fellow and, and which was the enfolded fellow and our residents get involved with research. Uh, and these are just some uh, images of how this technique works so that you can, in skull-based surgery, brain tumor surgery, you can get instantaneous biopsies as you go through um, the tumor uh, and understand where you are. Another area that we're really leading the way is with, is with augmented reality. Uh, Dr. Yurikov, who's uh, one of our spine surgery faculty and myself, just got two large grants from uh, Magic Leap on, on how to use this technology. A lot of departments in the country are using uh, uh, virtual reality like surgical theater, which is great for being in the classroom and talking about it outside the operating room, but that technology doesn't transform well into the operating room. So this is one, one um, uh, technique that we're developing now that um, uh, we actually could see in the operating room with 3D uh, how uh, we could see how to get to tumors and how to uh, approach them in a, in a novel way that advances not only your understanding of the case, but also helps with teaching in the operating room itself, not like in the classroom. Um, we talked about the Keynes level already, but obviously it's critical for any brain tumor surgeon to understand anatomy. And, and we hold this um, not only for our residents and fellows at least twice a year, uh, but also uh, in our weekly conferences, we're integrating the labs more and more into our education as well. So just quickly, I know there's a research talk later on by Dr. Shaw and Dr. Stark, but the UMBTI Research uh, Laboratory Group uh, is a kind of a composite of all the brain tumor surgeons, neuro-oncologists, and uh, basic science surgeons, uh, basic scientists at University of Miami um, that are focused on treating uh, really malignant brain tumors and looking at individual, patient individualized uh, therapy. We have one of the largest tissue banks in the, in the country with over 3,000 samples banked of tissue, blood, and CSF. And our, all of the laboratories are, again, on the UMBTI website on the Cancer Center. Uh, so we have five that are really dedicated 100% brain tumor labs. So my lab, Dr. I, um, which I'll talk about in a second, Dr. Ayed's lab, which really focuses on RNA-seq and uh, bromine domain inhibitors and single cell sequencing within tumors and glioblastoma. The Wellflow lab, which talks about radiation uh, and how radiation affects brain tumors. But the DIN lab, which Dr. Morcos talked about last, talks, uh, deals with vestibular schwannoma uh, treatment. And the Graham lab, which talks about um, uh, glioblastoma and, and new therapies for crossing the blood-brain barrier. The collaborating brain tumor lab is where I'd say about at least more than 50% of each one of those PIs are dedicated to brain tumors are also below, and I'm not gonna go through all the details there. Uh, some of the notable papers that have come out in the last year from that group is uh, uh, most recently was our uh, Nature Communications paper looking at uh, how to co do combined therapy for glioblastoma. Um, and, and I'm not going to go through all the papers, but you guys can read them as you see fit. My laboratory, just a quick plug um, at the end here, uh, so really focuses on glioblastoma stem cells. Uh, all the, the tumors and glioblastomas that we operate on, uh, we harvest and go to the tumor bank. And then we also select them to go and grow them out patient-derived tumors in, in the actual lab themselves. Uh, they're, they're difficult to grow, but currently we have 40 uh, stem cell lines growing. They're all characterized with their mutational status, and we make them available to all of our collaborators. Um, 
My lab is focused really on looking at new therapies for controlling glioblastoma as well as uh, brain tumor invasion. Um, we've developed some new novel uh, 2D uh, assays for invasion as well as a 3D assay with brain clearing to look at glioblastoma invades and also dealing with mini brains or glioblastoma organoids where we have a, a, an organoid grow and then use patient-derived glioma stem cells on top of them to see how they invade and, and into the, the organoid themselves. And that way you can develop a high throughput screening method. So uh, my lab, I have two dedicated scientists, uh, Anna and Tanya. Um, but just to understand how the research are involved, uh, Dan Eichberg, who's a PGY5, you know, he just got an NIH T32 grant to be in my lab for two years, um, focused on glioblastoma research and looking at two molecular inhibitors, uh, uh, MMP and uh, C97 uh, glioblastoma. Ashish Shah was in uh, the lab with myself and Dr. Kasahara two years ago. He was an NHR25 research fellow. Um, last year, I had two uh, amazing medical students, Alexa and Long, who were both um, NREF uh, research fellows. Alexa just joined uh, UCSF as a, as a resident, and Long is, is in medical school in South Florida here. Uh, yesterday, here's my uh, lab meeting with all of our medical students and undergrads uh, that we, we have weekly. Uh, there's plenty of, of students that are really involved in the brain tumor program and that are actively uh, engaged with our research program from both basic science, translational, and clinical. So overall, I mean, I, I think our program is just phenomenal. I don't see any weak points at all. Uh, and, and I think that you would be excellently trained if you came to Miami for a brain tumor um, for neurosurgery. And this is just a, a plug again, Dr. Morcos alluded to earlier that we do have the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium every Wednesdays. Anybody is welcome, uh, medical students, undergrad, residents, fellows, attendings, where we have a, a, a short talk on a topic and then kind of uh, some case presentations uh, at the end. And we encourage everybody to join and ask questions. If you have any questions, here's my email, my cell phone. I'm also on social media. If you want to uh, talk to me on there, uh, I'm happy to answer any of the questions. Uh, next up is Dr. Ragged, who's going to be talking about our pediatric uh, division. Good afternoon, everybody. One of the opportunities uh, in, in every crisis is to, is to take advantage of what it gives us. And uh, normally, the sub eyes rarely get a chance to see uh, or visit us in pediatric neurosurgery. So consider yourselves fortunate. Um, and, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about the uh, pediatric neurosurgery division. So, um, you know, our division is. Uh, 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 made up of uh, two senior uh, uh, neurosurgeons who uh, no longer operate, uh, Glenn Morrison, who's the chair emeritus of the division, um, uh, and Greg Hornig, who ran the, the uh, pediatric neurosurgery service uh, at uh, uh, Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. They uh, both are part of the teaching program uh, and attend conferences, uh, and Greg's involved in some of our outreach clinics. There are uh, four faculty, including myself, I'm fort we're fortunate to have uh, Tobin Iazzi, trained in Utah, um, and did a fellowship uh, in Seattle. Uh, Heather McRae, who trained at Cornell and did a fellowship in Boston, and Shelley Wang, who trained uh, in Toronto and was our fellow last year at, and is helping me with the epilepsy surgery. Um, so uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the service is spread across two campuses. This is the, the UM Jackson campus, uh, and pediatrics uh, is there at the Holtz, uh, which is integral in the Jackson campus. Um, and Heather McRae is primarily responsible for Holtz, uh, and uh, service there with a very busy uh, delivery service uh, and NICU. Um, when you are a, a first year resident, you'll get a chance to spend some time uh, covering the whole service along with Dr. McRae. Um, the Jackson campus uh, is about eight miles uh, from the Children's Hospital. It's about a 25 minute drive, but for some reason, we tend to lose a lot of the residents over here to South Beach. I don't know what happens when they leave Jackson, but there's a delay in getting them to Nicholas. Having said that, um, when you do finally get there, uh, the campus uh, used to look like this in the 1950s. It was a, a polio hospital at the edge of the Everglades, and we're fortunate to, to be part of the, the new tower, which is now um, open for the last three years. Uh, we have a neurology and neurosurgery floor with all private rooms and 12 uh, uh, epilepsy monitoring beds um, and an additional 24 uh, regular beds. We have our interoperative MRI suite uh, and a dedicated neurosurgical operating room and a two-suite uh, setup in addition to a, a non-IOMR uh, room for uh, other cases. Um, we do about 450 uh, operations a year between the two campuses, um, between uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital and the Holtz uh, Hospital. 
Um, there's a smattering of all sorts of pathology. This is uh, from my clinic over the next two, last two weeks. No, not the Calvin and Hobbes one, but the other tumors that you see there. Um, these are the challenges we see in pediatric neurosurgery. And unlike many other disciplines that are, that are uh, pigeonholed and I, they're cranial or spine, we do both in pediatric neurosurgery, although we all have our areas of interest. Um, one of our strengths here uh, in Miami is our epilepsy surgery program, which is one of the oldest pediatric epilepsy surgery programs in the world, uh, which uh, was founded in 1985 by Dr. Morrison and, the, and uh, a core group of neurologists. There have been over 1,300 operations on over 1,000 children, all accessible in a database uh, for your use, uh, should you be interested in epilepsy. The programs evolved from the original versions uh, where we did skull x-rays to localize the x-rays and implanted most of the children to um, now a more modern uh, imaging systems. The program data is available for use, uh, and what you see there are some volume numbers over the years, the number of patients that, are in, that require two-stage procedures, um, and then uh, the, the age of our patients, most of which are really quite young. So an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, in addition, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Wolf, uh, who's one of the craniofacial surgeons that you see here on your left. Uh, he was um, uh, Tessier's fellow uh, and wrote Tessier's biography. Uh, and he has a young associate who's with him for now about 10 years, Chad Perlin, both fellowship trained craniofacial surgeons. They have extraordinary numbers. Um, and have an accessible database as well for anybody interested in craniofacial surgery. Um, one of the things that virtually every applicant uh, asked me about is our work in Haiti. Dr. Green started a program uh, called Project MediShare uh, in the early 1990s, the goal of which was to provide primary care uh, in the plateau. Um, that program has evolved because of the demand for neurosurgical care for children uh, into a hydrocephalus program. And over the years, we've been fortunate to be able to care for over a thousand children with hydrocephalus. Um, uh, with the help of many of our colleagues from across the country. Many of the residents have come with me uh, over the years and it's, it's a, a tremendous experience for them. Um, it enriches us in many ways. I think most, uh, what I'm most proud of is, is the fact that this is the first neurosurgical trainee in Haiti. He's our third year uh, fellow. He's a fully trained general surgeon who now operates independently. And if you have the privilege to come to Haiti with us, he'll teach you how to do neuroendoscopy um, because of his experience. One of the things that we've taken from our experience in Haiti is our opportunity to learn how to apply what we've learned there in a resource poor environment to taking care of children here in North America. So we applied that uh, strategy of avoiding shunt placement and using endoscopic neurosurgery to avoid placing shunts in newborn babies born prematurely with uh, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. And we've showed a success rate comparable to um, third ventriculostomy uh, in other international series. Here's one of our residents uh, setting up the endoscope for a case uh, in Miami. Um, so we love having the residents on the service with us. We make them do all kinds of things like this is uh, Dan Eichmann uh, uh, doing uh, bring your child uh, to work lectures. Um, we'll teach you not what, how not to screw up shunts. We'll let you have a little bit of fun. Um, but I think the thing we're most proud of are the people that we've recruited into pediatric neurosurgery over the years. And these are uh, the faces of some of those people I've had the privilege to work with who've all gone on to become pediatric neurosurgeons. Three of them lead their own programs currently the most recent of which is uh, Joanna Gernsbach, who you see on your right. So thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to meeting you sometime in the future. I'll turn it over now to Eric Peterson, who's going to talk to you about endovascular. All right. Um, my name is Eric. I'm one of the uh, assistant professors here. I um, trained at the University of Washington and uh, was lucky enough to, to be able to stay here, and I've had a wonderful journey. So uh, we'll try to keep this short and sweet for you guys. Um, our practice set up, uh, a couple other people have already gone over this a little bit, um, but we actually have a, a, a number of different people that kind of uh, participate in, in the end of action service. Um, Bobby Stark is my, my junior partner, um, rock star neurosurgeon clinician scientist uh, from UVA, uh, has a full open and end of action practice as well as a extensive research practice, um, has an R01. Uh, I don't know where the guy finds the time, but uh, he, he manages to kind of do it all. Um, and then uh, I'm an associate professor here. I came here from the University of Washington. I did my end of ASHA training here, actually, and then um, was lucky enough to, to be offered an opportunity to stay on after that seven years ago um, and have, have been here ever since. And I've had a, a wonderful experience here, both as a fellow uh, and as uh, an attending. Um, we have an interventional neurology partner also, Dalip Yavagal, who's one of the uh, most well-known interventional neurologists uh, in the country. He's one of the first people uh, in the neurology field to, to do uh, endovascular training. He trained at UCLA, um, and he's been here uh, well over 10 years. 
We also have a, a group of fellows. Um, we always have a uh, senior fellow and a junior fellow. This year we have Josh Abikasis, who's uh, from University of Washington, is our senior fellow. Uh, and then Vasu is our um, junior fellow this year. Um, the operative angio suites, as you'll see in a moment, and all of our offices are in a different place than all the other um, surgical specialties. Um, and they're all kind of in one little location. So it's a really nice family. We have the same cases going over and over and everyone kind of rotates through and sees everyone's cases and, and, and works together. So it's a nice uh, end of asset division. Um, we have a unique uh, setup that Dr. Levy went through already, but just from a vascular stroke referral standpoint, um, as many of you know, for the endovascular and vascular cases, a lot of uh, them come through the ER, and therefore your referring doctor is the, the ambulance. So understanding this structure, I think, is important. Um, there's a number of satellite hospitals that all feed into our hospital. Um, and when I trained here, this was it. There was nothing else in town, and everything was kind of transferred to us. Every stroke came to us. Um, and over the last uh, several, you know, 10 years or so, particularly with the stroke revolution, uh, there's been a multiple of, uh, of other hospitals that have decided that they want to become a comprehensive stroke center. So as you can see, uh, there's a, a large number of comprehensive stroke centers in the area. But as you can see down by the University of Miami there, there's really nothing down in that huge downtown area. So regardless of the fact that we have all this local competition, we have so much traffic coming off of the streets. They were able to have a, a really large volume of strokes and carotids and aneurysms, so I feel very lucky. Um, there's also a, um, uh, most of the stuff we end up doing is at Jackson Memorial. Um, this is a large comprehensive stroke center, uh, as was previously mentioned, and most of our vascular has been routed here. Um, and, and for a variety of reasons, the infrastructure there has been, been most uh, built out over the last 20 years. Um, and, and we have uh, a couple of different really nice resources there. The first one is that we have two dedicated neuro uh, biplane rooms. Uh, a lot of places uh, that I've seen and that I work in other hospitals in the city have only one room and they share it with cardiology or body interventional. And so it's tough to get time in the suite. It's tough to, to have techs that don't actually know neuro that well. Or if you're trying to work on a monoplane, um, it's really just not good medicine. But to have do two brand new neuro biplane rooms that are dedicated just for neuro is, is a real gift and, and that's again a big reason why we do a lot of our work at, at Jackson. Uh, these are two of our fellows, uh, Stephanie and Mary Christine. Um, the other thing that's really nice about the system here is that there's no one else here, it's just us. Uh, the intervascular division does everything, so it's not just aneurysms and stroke, it's uh, ICAD for uh, stenting for intracranial atherosclerotic disease, tumor embolizations, carotid stenting, uh, vasospasm treatments, subdural embolizations, venous stenting, carotid blowouts. I mean, all the standard stuff that you do as a neurosurgeon, you can double all of that. And there's just a tremendous amount of vascular disease that we treat uh, as interventionals here that you don't get to do as a regular neurosurgeon. So it's, it's a really uh, broad experience. Um, and from a volume standpoint, um, it, it, keeps us, uh, it keeps us busy. We've also been one of the early pioneers for the radial approach, as many of you may know. Uh, we believe that this is a safer way of doing this uh, endovascular procedures, and uh, we've been able to do a lot of publications on, on showing that this is something that we think is safer. Um, our wonderful uh, illustrator uh, has, has had a lot of different um, cover articles, and, and the radial journey is, is no different, it's Roberto Suazo. Um, and the other thing that's really nice is that because, as I mentioned, we have everything on the endovascular services within 10 feet of each other, both endo rooms, all three of our offices, and the fellows room. Um, it's a really nice collaborative environment. These are a bunch of my fellows that I've trained over the years. Uh, that's Stephanie Chen, who's uh, finished up with us and is doing uh, Mike Lawton's uh, fellowship, and then a second end of actually year out in Seattle. Uh, Brian Sellings at a conference at Stroke Center uh, just north of us, uh, sitting down is uh, Justin Kaplan, who uh, finished up his training and went, went back to Hopkins to be an assistant professor. Um, and then pre there is uh, another assistant professor at, uh, uh, at Rutgers. So it's a very nice uh, hands-on for the fellows, but, but also hands-on from a teaching perspective. Um, that's how I was trained when I came down here with Ali Sultan and, and Jacques Morcos, and, and that's how I really feel that the fellows should be trained. So uh, between the volume and the infrastructure, infrastructure and the resources and the commitment to teaching and hands-on nature of everything, it's, it's a really nice experience for everybody. And of course, um, you know, when you're when you're finish your case of the day, uh, you don't have to go out into the freezing cold of, of some place. You get to do this. So it's a nice setup. Thanks for your time. So starting with neurotrauma now, the program is run by Dr. Jagged. He's the medical director for the cranial trauma 
and for functional neurosurgery. I'm Joe Gracioli, a fellow in the department. So as you guys heard from Dr. Levy, we're the third most populous state in the country. So there's a lot going down here uh, in different aspects, including trauma. This, therefore, we run one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. It's called Rider Trauma Center. In the Rider, we have six dedicated trauma ORs, 25 ICU beds, and a dedicated floor for neuro rehab for patients that suffer, suffered from uh, brain and spinal cord injury. And we're about to inaugurate a building dedicated exclusively for the rehab. So we have also substantial funding from different layers, layers of the government of fund, uh, uh, government. The Rider Trauma is part of the university campus in which we admit over 500 cases of TBI patients per year. Around, around 100 of them end up needing a craniotomy or craniectomy for treatment. And one fourth of them are victims of gunshot wound. We also have the Neurocritical Care Unit and the Jackson uh, Memorial Hospital in which 24 beds are dedicated for neuro neurocritical care. We can offer the patients a cutting edge monitoring, uh, trying to improve the functional outcome, including the Moberg monitor, the CNS, in which we can monitor electrophysiological activity, intracranial pressure, temperature, cerebral blood flow, and microdialysis. We are the only center where military medics can train for up to six months before being deployed to combat. We have a wide spectrum of traumatic pathologies, including closed head injuries, penetrating injuries, and a significant amount of the patients end up needing a decompressive craniectomy, as you can see in this reconstruction here. Typically, the PGY2s would run the service for four months each. We have three per year. Uh, each resident, each PGY2 would usually perform over 30 craniotomies or craniectomies for trauma. Uh, we fellows give them support along with four attendings. Uh, we like to expose the juniors for this kind of procedure early on the training because they can expedite the technical aspects of doing a fast craniotomy or craniectomy and to improve the hemostasis skills, which is sometimes very intensive in the setting of the trauma. We have different trials going on in the department as well. As we, um, I'd like to mention the TREK TBI, which is an uh, international uh, effort to transform research and clinical knowledge in traumatic brain injury. There are several sub-studies that come from the TREK TBI. TREK TBI is a prospective observational study in which we're gathering information from different aspects of the traumatic brain injury to improve the, the outcome of our patients. Uh, the substudy called SD2 is, SD stands for spread depolarization. Thanks, Daniel Samano, for the slides. The spread depolarization is believed to play a major role in trauma and spontaneous subarachnoidal bleedings, in which the injured tissue, we call the core of the injury, uh, is surrounded by a penumbra of viable tissue. And we see that this penumbra occasionally in the beginning and more frequently as the disease goes on, triggers this massive wave of profound depolarizing um, uh, 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 events that culminate with uh, uh, intense de depletion in the cell resources and Cellular death is the result of this. So the, we're gathering efforts trying to detect early the spread of polarization and trying to treat uh, with ketamine or other, other uh, resources. So in this study, the patients are assigned for three arms according to the treatment they need. Again, this is a perspective non-intervention study so, so far. So the patients that are not operated on, they re receive intra, uh, <clears throat> non-invasive uh, the patients that become a percutaneous monitor are implanted with an intracortical electrode and the patients that undergo craniotomy or craniectomy are implanted with a strip in order to detect and treat this polarization. And lastly, 
I'd like to finish the talk talking about the, this other study that we are running in the department in collaboration with many centers in the US, Europe, and Australia. Uh, it's called EpiBios because uh, epilepsy is a major issue in the traumatic brain injury. I don't know if you guys are aware, but from 20 to 30 percent of the patients that require a craniotomy for an intracranial bleeding end up developing late epilepsy. And so far, there is no way to prevent it. Uh, therefore, this prospective study is gathering information from moderate and severe TBI patients using preclinical da data from biomarkers in trauma and epilepsy and trying to correlate with uh, electrophysiological findings, imaging, and molecular um, biomarkers from CSF and uh, blood uh, samples, aiming to understand the epileptogenesis in a more profound way, trying to prevent the development or to improve the treatment of the epilepsy uh, and the long term of the patient care. Well, with that, we finish the part of neurotrauma, and I'd like to pass the baton to my brilliant colleague, Dr. Cahigas, who is about to blow your mind with the efforts we're doing in functional neurosurgery. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Uh, Thank you for joining us to learn a little bit about uh, the University of Miami uh, neurosurgery uh, program. The, the functional pro, uh, part of our neurosurgery program is very exciting part to me um, because it's a really a translational um, effort of bringing what we know in the basic sciences to patient care. It's a programs run by by Dr. Jagged and Dr. Ivan, who helps with the epilepsy uh, resections. And uh, Joe is our current uh, functional fellow, and I'm a former uh, functional fellow during my enfolded uh, years and current chief resident. So the functional program in epilepsy is based out of the University of Miami and Jackson hospitals. Um, we do both DBS cases and epilepsy cases at both institutions, and primarily have our inpatient EMU for monitoring epilepsy patients at the University of Miami Hospital. Uh, it's a very big collaborative effort between neurology uh, and neuropsychology and neurosurgery. And uh, every week there are uh, multidisciplinary conferences on epilepsy and movement disorders uh, with, to help with patient selection and uh, guiding uh, each patient's individualized treatment. Uh, we have a CAST approved fellowship. Um, here are some of the most recent fellows that have done both the uh, enfolded and post residency uh, functional epilepsy uh, fellowship. Most recently, uh, Dr. Christian Theodotu, which just started a few weeks ago. Um, we have access to uh, new robotic technology, uh, which includes the ROSA, which is being used both for um, tumor uh, biopsies and laser ablations, as well as for our functional uh, stereotactic implantations in epilepsy. And uh, we've really been at the cutting edge, thanks to Dr. Jagged's early adoption of uh, laser, um, laser interstitial thermal therapy. And uh, the former fellows and I have been involved in, in a lot of the largest series in terms of laser ablations for epilepsy. Uh, which you can find uh, online. Uh, this is where we place a catheter stereotactically into uh, an epileptogenic focus, such as the mesial temporal lobe, and uh, below you can see a uh, standard ablation. This is minimally invasive, and unlike open craniotomies, patients get to go home uh, as early as postoperative day one. This uh, Technique, as Dr. Ivan mentioned, is also used in the, by, uh, in the tumor field. Uh, and because Dr. Ivan works with both uh, our epilepsy and with the tumor uh, surgery, there's a lot of crosstalk in terms of the research uh, that is ongoing, uh, whether it's ablating with a single fiber, a deep-seated uh, lesion that would otherwise could be called unresectable or uh, you know, it would require a lot of morbidity with a large procedure, such as here, uh, seen in the images there, or with, you know, targeting a larger lesion that uh, would be very difficult uh, to target with a single laser. laser we've tried um, double fibers uh, to get it. We're um, very involved with the new techniques that are uh, out there to treat epilepsy. Uh, these in include the uh, responsive neuromodulation, such as the neuropace, which you can see at the top right, 
These are uh, implanted devices that this device is implanted in the skull and has leads near the epileptogenic focus and uh, detects when epileptogenic activity or epileptic activity is detected. It can stimulate the brain almost like a pacemaker and kind of depolarize a particular region to prevent the spread of a, a seizure. Um, you can see on the bottom left, uh, thanks to our ROSA, we're able to do um, implantations of the stereo EEG to figure out where uh, someone's epilepsy might be coming from and then use that to guide further treatment. And uh, we've also been uh, early adopters of the anterior nucleus uh, thalamus uh, DBS for, um, for epilepsy. Uh, we have a very large program. Uh, we've done over a thousand cases uh, the last uh, 10 years. Um, this is for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, uh, dystonia, and epilepsy, as I mentioned, with the anterior nucleus of thalamus uh, deep brain stimulation. It, it would be impossible to do these surgeries without our neurosurgical colleagues. And you can see Dr. Luca here in the bottom left uh, in the medical uh, school uh, with one of our patients just showing to, uh, you know, the results of appropriately targeted DBS are. You can see the patient's tremor just completely go away when the device is uh, turned on and improve their quality of life. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we also do a, quite a bit of work with pain. You can see Dr. Jagged here doing an ablation. Uh, for facial pain, uh, and uh, as well as large resections uh, for epilepsy or a, a large right frontal uh, lobectomy. And using our stereotactic techniques, we can get to areas which open surgery might uh, cause a lot of morbidity. In case uh, of a brainstem, for example, we can do stereotactic biopsies. The functional uh, program has a great collaboration with the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis. Um, and a lot of the basic science from the Miami has helped drive some of the current research studies, uh, anywhere from modeling how the brain centers control the repair after injury, um, stimulating areas of the periaqueductal gray after spinal cord injury for neuropathic pain, which was a DOD funded study. And most recently where we've been working with a uh, brain machine interface uh, that we've uh, developed uh, to uh, help patients with uh, cervical uh, quadriplegia uh, restore or some hand and see there's an article where we were featured in the uh, Washington Post. Uh, here we implant a subclavicular generator in, in, in one patient who had had a trauma several years ago. Uh, he's four years post-trauma, has minimal hand function, and we implanted electrodes over the uh, dominant hand motor area. And we can detect by reading these uh, brain signals across the skin when he's thinking about moving his hand and use electrical stimulation or an ortho to open and close his hand. You can see this, uh, the patient here uh, picking up uh, a chip and transferring it to target. And just understand that he's just thinking about opening and closing his hand and the device is uh, being triggered. It's, uh, this was the first day he used it, so it was a little bit slower to uh, relax so he could uh, drop the chip. But uh, we just deployed this system uh, for home use uh, three days ago excited about that work. And we have a multi-center collaborations with MIT on this uh, brain machine interface work. You establish collaborations uh, with uh, NYU to do some work on automatic uh, AI-based um, detection of interictal activity. And we work with a lab at Johns Hopkins uh, who is helping us with um, uh, computer-based methods to detect the uh, epileptogenic zone so that we can guide our um, open surgical resections. Um, most recently, we started a clinical trial uh, based on some novel work from the Miami Project, understanding the locomotive centers in the brain. Um, here you can see um, some of the clinical work where we're able to modulate the speed of ambulation in this pig just by stimulating in an area called the cuneiform nucleus. And we're gonna translate some of this work to help patients with um, freezing of gait and Parkinson's disease to help them uh, improve their quality of life. And we're currently recruiting subjects for this study. Um, so thanks again for your time this afternoon. Um, you know,
please reach out um, to me or any of the other speakers if you have any questions, either by Instagram, Twitter, or by email. Uh, and now I'll pass it on to uh, uh, the next speaker. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Greg Basil. I'm one of the current PGY6 residents here, and myself, uh, Dr. Leonakis and uh, Dr. Chen are gonna be um, talking to you guys about the program um, from a resident's perspective. Um, now, you know, I think the, the, the first thing that everybody wants to know is what is the structure of the residency year to year? And so we have that here. You guys can find this online. There's a couple of things to point out here. The first is that all of our rotations are four months um, and that'll be through your whole residency. And that's really important because uh, it's enough time that you really get to integrate into a service. So when you're on the spine service, you feel like a spine surgeon. When you're on a cranial service, you're uh, dedicated to cranial work. And, and we find that that structure is very beneficial. And the other thing which has been mentioned already is that we've moved to a 6-1 structure. We think really this is gonna be the future. Um, you know, we want all of our residents to not only have the opportunity to do enfolded fellowships, but for those fellowships to be CAS accredited. And that's why we've changed the structure. So your sixth year will be your chief year and your seventh year then um, you'll be able to go ahead and do your CAS accredited fellowship. Um, So uh, in terms of uh, the year-to-year -year breakdown, um, in your uh, junior residency, uh, PGY one year, uh, it's broken up into cranial, uh, UMH, uh, and neurology. Um, cranial uh, is certainly a, a challenging uh, rotation. Um, that's where you uh, are basically learning how to be a neurosurgeon for the first time. You're managing the entire service, um, the ICU, you're seeing uh, consults. Um, uh, you're putting in EVDs, doing procedures. So uh, we, we view that as a very formative period of time. Uh, your next four months is, is at UMH. That's a, a really great rotation. Um, we have a great nurse practitioner help there. You really get to be in the operating room um, pretty much uh, every day. This is actually a photo of Dr. Leonakis when he was an intern operating doing a crania at UMH and in neurology, obviously where you learn uh, the foundations of, of uh, neurology, which is critical. Uh, in terms of your PGY2 year, um, that's broken up into cranial, neurotrauma, and spine. Um, cranial two year is great because the intern really manages the floor in the ICU. Obviously, you help them and you teach them, um, but uh, it, you, know, you really get to be in the operating room every day, which is amazing. Trauma service, as was mentioned, um, you're kind of the chief on service as a two, which is a really unusual experience, uh, and really a great learning time. Obviously, a very busy trauma service. And then spine. Um, and the nice thing when you're on spine, you have help from the orthopedic um, surgery intern. So uh, also we'll get to be in the operating room a lot, which is really important. Um, your PGY three year, you go back to UMH for four months, which is, uh, that's a really great time because as a, as a three at UMH, um, you're, you're heavily involved in the operating room as well as on the floor. The VA rotation, which is also um, really great surgery, Dr. Yurkov um, and Dr. Benvenisse over there. Uh, Dr. Yurikov is doing a lot of endoscopic spine surgery, minimally invasive spine surgery. And then the pediatric rotation, which Dr. Ragib spoke about, has always been one of the uh, favorites of, of the residents. Um, your elective time as a PGY4, um, you'll have four months of uh, uh, endovascular uh, neuroradiology. And then uh, if you decide to do an enfolded fellowship, you can do it then um, for, for the rest of that year or do research. And then again, now you'll do your second um, true enfolded fellowship in your in your seventh year, and, and obviously we have opportunities in pretty much every subspecialty. Um, I won't go over this because we've already talked about our research extensively. We're obviously very proud. Um, Dr. Levy spoke about that. Um, Dr. He has spoke about that, and we, we're incredibly productive, and we're only becoming more productive. In terms of senior residency, um, it, it's it's a very nice structure. You know, you, you certainly work. Um, very hard in every year of residency and senior residency is no different, but as a senior resident, you are an operative resident. So um, you're spending day in, day out uh, in the operating room, heavily dependent upon. Um, the call burden is very, very light. Um, you're the senior resident on call, you know, Q7 or something to that effect. Um, and, and you do your core rotations at uh, cranial spine and UMH. And you know, this is just, that was a video of one of our senior residents clipping an aneurysm. This is a senior resident doing a deformity case. Um, and and um, obviously your PGY seven year, as we mentioned, would be now your enfolded CAS accredited uh, fellowship year. 
and you know, this has been talked about before. Um, I don't want to belabor it, but um, you know, incredibly, incredibly busy operative experience, 11 hours per day, 15 to 20 cases per weekday, and over 5,000 cases per year. So you will not have um, any shortage of, of uh, surgical experience while you're here. Um, and then Dr. Leonakis is going to take over now and talk to you a little bit about um, some of the academic conferences. Thanks, Greg. Uh, my video doesn't seem to be working, so I'll talk to you through here, as long as you guys can hear me just fine. You know, Greg was just talking about the great operative experience that we get. Um, in addition to that, the academic conferences really are a cornerstone of the program. Um, one of the big things that Miami has that, you know, really drew me to the program and a lot of us is daily academic morning conferences from 7 to 8 that have been traditionally led by Dr. Heroes. In addition to that, there's Grand Rounds and uh, multiple afternoon conferences as well. Um, next slide. So again, like I said, daily morning conferences, 7 a.m. after the patients have been checked into the OR and after rounds have completed. Um, and, uh, you know, Dr. Hero has traditionally run these. We look over cases that have come in the night before. We look over interesting cases for the OR that day. And it's an excellent way to teach uh, the juniors and seniors alike. Okay, and again, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about it, but the Keynes Lab recently fully established is our anatomy lab uh, for both cranial and spine surgery. You can see here on the, the left-sided picture, this is a picture of uh, Dr. Basil going through the endoscopic approach to localizing uh, uh, for an endoscopic discectomy through Camden's triangle, teaching the residents this. This is a great opportunity in the lab. We have cadavers in there as well. And then over on the right, we have multiple operating microscopes uh, with cadavers available for dissection. So this is a huge opportunity. Um, we have a lot of uh, sessions um, that are put on throughout the year for different cranial approaches. Um, and all our faculty get involved, and it's a really excellent teaching experience. Call frequency, uh, switching gears just a little bit. Um, it's not too overwhelming. For the PGY2s, that's when you're primarily taking uh, in-house call um, at the ja at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Um, typically, that's Q4, Q5, 24-hour uh, call. When you're a third-year resident and you're on service at the VA, you will also be taking call at Jackson as well. And then for the other hospitals, like University of Miami Hospital as well, it's home call, typically. Um, as a PGY-4, uh, you start to take less. You take maybe two in-house calls a month, and then you start doing senior call. And after that, you basically finish with your junior call uh, in-house um, responsibilities, and you go on to just taking uh, senior call. And what I mean by senior call is that, uh, you know, if there is an operative case, um, you come in and do the case. You also act as a secondary support for the junior resident who's on, um, and that's also for 24 hours. Uh, next slide. Yep. Again, and we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of call rooms available. There's a lot of places to to work and and get things done while you know while you're waiting for the next thing to come in. We have a work room. Uh, that's fully uh, equipped with multiple computers, uh, books, etc., and then several call rooms where you can get rest if you need. And then finally, just to kind of round things out, uh, you know, benefits, you know, we won't go too much into this. It's very competitive compared to uh, other programs in the country, but a huge thing for us is that there's no income tax in the state of Florida, so you're getting a bigger piece of that pie. Uh, and then again, uh, some academic benefits that other places may not have that we really do well in. You get a $2,000 stipend each from both Jackson Memorial Hospital and uh, the neurosurgery department. So that's $4,000 a year extra on top of your pay that you can put towards, uh, you know, books, lead, loops, equipment, anything like that. And then also food allowances here as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I won't go too much over this. Basically, all the benefits that you get everywhere, including uh, medical insurance, dental, vision, everything you need to take care of yourself and your family. And now I will turn over to uh, Stephanie Chen, our uh, other uh, PGY6, who will continue uh, the talk here. Yeah, I'm just going to finish up talking a little bit about residency life. Um, I think one of the hard things about not actually doing a sub I is not being able to get a feel for the program. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that it really is 
it's a family and we are a very tight-knit uh, group and you really can't beat living in Miami. Uh, this is just a picture of the beach. Um, it's beautiful day in, day out, um, and that really is something special when you're working as hard as we do. Um, just so you know, there's a little something for everything in, uh, in Miami, a little something for everyone in Miami. There's um, a number of different neighborhoods. Wynwood is sort of the artsy neighborhood, lots of restaurants, bars, um, galleries, active nightlife, and there's South Beach, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, which has a very big party scene, but also can be beautiful and serene and relaxing, and uh, lots of the residents live there. There's Little Havana, which brings in um, sort of the Cuban Latin history of Miami where you can get a lot of great food and then Coconut Grove which is where a lot of our residents live and start families and tends to be a little bit more suburban. Life outside of residency you will have one I promise. Um, like I said we're a big family this is the softball tournament we won a few years ago. Um, we do a lot of hanging out outside of the hospital on boats in Wynwood. I think this is a picture of us cheering on Timmer at, at the American Ninja Warrior contest. Um, you see Dr. Wang at the bottom there hanging out with the Spine Fellows. Um, next. Um, conferences outside of the hospital, Dr. Ragged leading a, a journal club um, at a restaurant and again just all of us spending a lot of time together. Every year Timmer does a competition where we do a number of physical and <laughs> neurosurgical tasks um, at the start of the year and we have the neurosurgery regatta where all of our attendings bring out their boats, we go to the sandbar, um, you see <laughs> Evan hanging out with guns, going to the spa, wedding, Soho House, all the important things, you know. And in terms of getting personal, you know, you will need a support system both in and out of the hospital. And um, here the residents are very happy. There's 21 total residents. 12 are married and at least one is engaged. There's, I think, six that are in serious relationships and two are single, but that is subject to change at any point in time, given this is Miami. Um, there are a number of kids and lots and lots of uh, support animals. There is a lot of our residents getting married. You know, this is a huge chunk of your youth that you're spending somewhere. And it's really important to realize that the people that you meet, the people you spend time with, these are lifetime relationships. Um, and of course, the animals and the children uh, that you have are also a big part of it. Greg is really rushing me along here. <laughs> Life inside of residency, it's a lot of operating and a lot of spending time with each other. Again, um, you have to love the people that you work with and you will if you come here. Um, this is some of us operating together, doing labs together, Kane's lab, I think that's an endoscopic lab. Um, our support staff is awesome. You see Roberto somewhere in the middle with all of our staff um, hanging out in the resident room, playing with the Xbox. I don't know what Rick is doing there, eating star fruit. Star fruit. Um, yeah, star fruit, nice. Next. And for all of those who say you won't sleep in residency, uh, you will sleep just in various positions in uh, various times, most importantly during conferences and grand rounds. So all in all, um, it's a really great program. Like I said, it's a big family. We want people who uh, are interested in being a part of a team. And we want people who um, really value supporting each other. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to email us, uh, contact us. And now I think Dr. Stark, who is one of my mentors and is an awesome research researcher and scientist, and Ashish, who is one of our current chiefs, is gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about research. Thanks so much. Awesome talks by uh, the residents, rest of the faculty. Um, we'll keep this brief, but just talk a little bit about research. It's too bad that uh, Dr. Dietrich, one of the other directors, couldn't join us today. But my area is primarily uh, open endovascular. Um, talking about University of Miami, I think this was extensively gone through today. But uh, this is a massive medical center, many hospitals, but we're also surrounded by a tremendous number of other departments in all fields. So it's not just neurosurgery, but it extends to pretty much every uh, discipline, genetics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera.
So we're usually in the top three in NIH funding for neurosurgery departments. Um, other areas that are really helpful for the residents are the R25 program, which was started uh, specifically to help get residents NIH funding and progress them through their careers. There's also the CTSI program, which helps, uh, helps folks get a master's and provides additional NIH funding to support research. Um, there's many other facets that help research along, including uh, grant writing classes, et cetera, et cetera. My area is mainly in, uh, in open vascular, endovascular. My lab is in the biomedical research building. This is the top floor. In the bottom floor, we have biplane angiography, MRI. We just put in a CT scanner, ultrasound. That's all for large, uh, just for research uses. Um, these are some of my collaborators, and you can see here that aside from neurosurgery, you can find a mentor in really any discipline. So I also collaborate with folks in ophthalmology, vascular surgery, molecular biology, biochemistry, cardiology, genetics, et cetera. And so I think even if you want to go outside your air, area and field, there's an extensive number of departments to interact with. We work on a lot of uh, new and developing technologies in endovascular as well as collaborate with many other scientists, but also uh, have the support of many companies that come in and, and regularly test things in our laboratory. These are our clinical research studies going. So as you move your translational research through to uh, human research, um, we have about 15 studies ongoing right now that enroll patients for either endovascular or open vascular type studies. Easy for residents to get involved in obviously any facets of these elements. So in a brief summary, research not mandatory, includes clinical, translational, or basic science, and I think we have uh, covered all of these extensively. Translational studies also include an extensive collaborators and engineering, if that's a track that you want to go down. And pretty much every discipline is, is represented at, at University of Miami here. So if there's something that you want to step outside of neurosurgery or bring those elements into neurosurgery, it's quite easy to do. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ashish Shah. He's one of our phenomenal chiefs uh, who's had a, an extremely productive research year, and we're all excited to see how he progresses in the next phase as an attending soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a great presentation. I hope you guys are staying with us for all of this. Um, so I want to give a little bit of a background on the resident research opportunities and basically uh, what, what's going on at the University of Miami to kind of give you an idea. This is our undergrad campus, uh, certainly an area where you can collaborate uh, in the future uh, if you want, as, long, as well as the medical campus. Um, just to give you a, a background, I cannot stress this enough, uh, research is an essential pillar of academic neurosurgery here in Miami. Uh, this is Lois Pope Life Center. This is basically where we are uh, where our research enterprise is kind of focused here. Uh, our neurosurgery department has seven floors of research space here that you can basically take advantage of during your uh, time here as a resident. Uh, not to mention there are several other buildings, which I'll talk about in a little bit, where you can kind of capitalize on uh, the, uh, our research infrastructure, which is pretty unparalleled, uh, not only in Florida, but I think acro uh, uh, across the country. So, you know, as you pick any residency program, you kind of look at what's the, what's the most important thing if you're interested in research. And I think the most important thing is, is early exposure and early mentorship to research opportunities. And we uh, have really uh, emphasized this early on in your residency as a PTY one and two. You're kind of this baby here, you know, you're starting off to learn to walk and you need to identify your research interests, you know, identify mentors. And our R25 program helps you do that. And we kind of identify people in, in the, in the, university that are, um, you know, the gear at your specific research interest so you can kind of uh, work with them early, identify some specific aims to kind of get your feet wet uh, so that when you start as a PGY4, you're, you know, really kind of hit the ground running. Uh, and this is the kind of time where you're, you know, spent a year as a dedicated research year, you generate your preliminary data, you start to work on manuscripts. Um, this is uh, right before your PGY4 year, you can, uh, apply for this R25, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but basically that gives you that, that salary and that kind of prestige to kind of you know, you know, get your research started. Um, and uh, this is a completely protected year. You're not getting pulled to cases in the middle of the year. Uh, and this is a very unique opportunity that we uh, offer. Um, and so as you finish your PGY4 year and you kind of move on to chief residency, senior residency, where you're publishing your papers, 
you start identifying grant opportunities for yourself for the future. So when you become a faculty member, you can start to kind of, you know, move yourself forward in that in that realm as well. Um, and then as you become a PGY7, we have this 6-1 structure, which, you know, Greg and Stephanie and Jason have mentioned, but this is basically a time for you to, you know, engage in elective research opportunities. If you want to do more research in the lab, you can. If you want to do an ex folded fellowship and go somewhere else or stay in the, in the department and do it in folded fellowship, you can. Um, and so this is kind of a very nice year. And so as a PGY7, you can even finish up your projects you were doing as a PGY4, and that kind of gives you that gateway to, uh, uh, you know, apply for, uh, you know, an R or a K award as well. Um, and it's important as a PGY7, you can also do um, an R25 extension and get, uh, you know, basically 50% of your time uh, paid for as well, which is a nice option, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then you kind of get older as you move on to, you know, chairmanship here uh, as, as you get to, as you progress. Um, so what is an R25 and why does it exist? Um, so the R25 is basically a program that the NINDS made so they can retain scientists uh, who are also neurosurgeons. Um, so uh, only a few programs have been given R25 status uh, at, and we are one of them. Um, and basically it lets you dedicate one to two years of dedicated research, uh, basic or translational research during your residency. Uh, with the goal that you uh, will be uh, ushered into a career as an independent NIH-funded researcher. So this is a very kind of unique uh, opportunity that our program offers, uh, and we have spectacular mentors. Um, as I mentioned, there are only 13 programs in the country that have R25s, and you know there are like 110 neurosurgery programs, so there's only 10% that have R25s, and out of them, you know, we have one. Um, uh, so these are going to kind of list of programs. And I think it's important when you're looking at programs to apply to, to look at programs that offer you opportunities for research because you don't, you know, as a medical student, you may not know if you want to stay in academics or private practice, but you need to have all of these opportunities available. Um, uh, briefly, you know, the R25 offers you uh, money for travel, for administrative support. Uh, it gives you a yearly workshop, which is, I think, very, very unique. You're basically in a workshop with all the leaders in neurosurgery who are all physician scientists who basically look at your specific aims individually and kind of give you, uh, you know, critique feedback. So this is a very unique opportunity that uh, the, the R25 uh, gives, uh, you know, uh, gives these programs. Uh, at the University of Miami, we have several uh, uh, basically landmark uh, in institutes where you can collaborate and do your research in uh, from human genomics, the brain tumor initiative, the Miami project uh, uh, to the CTSI. So all these are opportunities for you to uh, leverage. Um, the mentors in the program, you know, we have about 25 to 30 mentors in our R25 who all have, you know, R01 or equivalent funding and who have basically had a previous history of mentoring uh, residents and trainees uh, to become physician scientists. So this is a unique opportunity as well. Um, so, I mean, in general, you know, you, you know, I suggest that, you know, when you're early, getting early involved in residency, you should be familiar with different funding strategies. You know, as a resident and a fellow, you need to be, uh, you know, aware of the different funding strategies, such as the R25, T32, or private and foundational grants, all of which you have access to at our department. And then basically these will kind of transition you to basically junior faculty grants, such as K awards, uh, and then eventually to R awards. Um, so, you know, in our department, our research paradigm is very successful. I mean, these are just a few of our residents who have uh, NIH funding. I mean, Shelby Burks has an R, uh, you know, R21 uh, with Dr. Levy uh, doing peripheral nerve research. Uh, me and Ian are both R25 recipients. Steffi Chen has a foundational grant from the AANS to do research in uh, uh, endovascular and vascular therapies. Uh, and Dan Eichberg uh, uh, just got a T32 in surgical oncology doing some research in Dr. Ivan's lab. So, I mean, this is just proof in the pudding that everything that we do in our research and, uh, in our, in our research uh, paradigm is successful. And this is what you wanna look at as you're looking at a program. You wanna say that, okay, well, are these residents getting funding so they can be scientists in the future? And the answer is very clearly here, yes. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you know, you ask yourself, oh, are we publishing papers? Um, and you can see over the last 10 years, we've published a significant amount of papers um, and it's only rising, uh, H index of all our residents is rising exponentially. Um, and uh, uh, on top of that, you know, you know, you, I've, you know, several of you asked questions about translational research. Uh, and, you know, I think not only is it important to write grants to publish papers, but to show that your research is now being translated to patients. Um, now these are just three clinical trials, all on clinicaltrials.gov of residents who have kind of 
initiated these this research interest and have kind of been, have moved these their research into the clinical uh, realm. And these are uh, you know three different clinical trials going on. Uh, this is just a fraction of the stuff going on at the University of Miami, but this is just an example of resident kind of initiated research um, and showing you uh, you know what what is Kate what you what is possible if you're a resident at our institution. And I, I guarantee you. Not a lot of other programs have this opportunity. So uh, in short, I don't want to bore you guys, um, you know, but, uh, you know, come visit the University of Miami. We have a unique experience uh, um, that I think that is unparalleled in the country. Our research is, uh, is uh, you know, only growing. Um, hopefully when this COVID outbreak uh, dies down, you can, uh, you know, come visit what it is to be part of the University of Miami. I'll uh, now give time to Dr. Komatar. I think he has uh, some question and answers that he was... All right, great. Thanks, Ashish. I think uh, just while Iggy is loading up uh, my talk, I just want to say thanks to everyone uh, for taking out time on their Saturday. I think it's pretty safe to say this is a very special program. Um, you know, more than just case numbers or the research and stuff, it's, it's really the intangibles that make this place so special. Um, I can tell you as program director, uh, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. It's definitely the best part of my job is to uh, lead this program. I think all the attendings would also uh, support that. I think our residents are the top 1% and being able to mentor them and guide them and have these, you know, very enthusiastic leaders in the field, uh, it's really the best part of our job. And I think the general gist of this sub I, I think that, that, the, that the take home message would be that, you know, residents aren't just here to do the work. Uh, they're not just a part of the department. I think the residency is the central part of this department. Uh, and the residents are the engine that really make this department run. So um, really couldn't say enough about how proud we are of our program. Uh, and this really is the very best residency program in the country for all the reasons you heard. Uh, Iggy, if you can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna just talk about, you know, for you guys, what do you need to be looking at at a residency program when you guys interview? Uh, there's really three things you want to look at. Uh, you want to look at what the quality of the faculty is. What are the types of cases that they're doing? Uh, you want to look at the opportunities uh, to do academics, to grow, and really what's the quality of life. I think Stephanie said it best. Uh, this is seven years of your life. It's a major part of your youth. And you don't want to sacrifice quality of life uh, for quality of training because there's a lot of excellent programs out there that offer both. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just like Dr. Levy said at the beginning, UM has, in my opinion, uh, the best faculty in the country. Uh, it really has a tremendous amount of volume. Every specialty is covered. Uh, every specialty not only is covered, but you have a senior faculty and a junior faculty. Um, it's very stable, so you're not coming to a program where if someone leaves, it's, it's going to fall apart. Uh, this faculty is stable throughout, and even if people were to leave, which I don't see happening, uh, it still would be a very tremendous faculty. So. Um, if you could just click that button, Iggy. So anyway, uh, so the result is that everyone who comes here will get the absolute best clinical training uh, when it comes to neurosurgery. Uh, next thing you gotta look at are what are the opportunities for academic growth? Again, we're not looking for just people who are gonna be surgeons. We want people who are gonna be leaders in the field and publish and, and really push neurosurgery forward. So here you have two full years uh, year four and year seven. Uh, you can use those as you please. As long as you have a good idea, we're, we're, we're certainly willing to kind of support it. Um, it can either be dedicated research, it can be dedicated fellowships, it can be some kind of combination of both. Uh, as you saw that the re uh, research um, infrastructure is super robust um, and really any type of mentorship, any type of project that you want to do, as long as it's well thought out, we are certainly willing to push it ahead. Uh, and again, starting day one, academics and publications are very highly encouraged. So it's not something that's just done during your elective years. It really starts the day that you set foot on campus and you use those elective years to kind of push ahead. And again, I think the result is that if you look at our graduates, they really become leaders uh, in academic neurosurgery, not just, you know, not just great surgeons, but also leaders in the field. Uh, and then finally, quality of life. Again, scut work um, is minimized. Uh, primary junior call is really condensed down to only two years. Uh, lots of ancillary staff to help with that scut work. Um, obviously, this is a great city uh, and it's a great environment. And I really can't stress that enough. This is not, you know, it's not like an us versus them mentality. It's not residents versus attendings. Uh, faculty and residents are really family here. 
Um, and really everyone gets along. I mean, all the residents call me by my first name. Uh, they're all friends, they're all family. Uh, and it's a great environment to really work in. And so I, I really don't think you find that in many other top programs. And the result, uh, if you could just press that button, Iggy. So I think that really here, it's the best quality of life possible as a resident. So I guess the next question is, what do we expect out of the applicants? What do we expect out of our residents? One, we wanna see passion for the field of neurosurgery. So we don't just want people who are gonna come in, do surgery and leave. We want people who really have a passion for the field, who wanna push it forward and who are working outside the boundaries. So not just surgery, but really advancing the field. Uh, really have to have a pursuit of technical excellence. So number one, you have to graduate being an excellent technical surgeon. And as you saw um, in all the prior talks, 5,000 plus cases, every specialty covered, without a doubt, you will come out being technically excellent. Uh, again, you, you really have to be committed to more than just surgery. That's the first pillar, but you also have to do academic achievements. So you have to use those two elective years uh, you know, get grants, do research, do fellowships, you know, be involved in organized neurosurgery uh, and really push the boundaries of academic neurosurgery. Um, as I said, and as Dr. Morco said, really get involved in organized neurosurgery. That starts again day one and having faculty here, which is, which is very important to kind of push you ahead to get you involved early. I think that that's, that's critical to becoming um, an academic neurosurgeon and to landing a, a top-notch faculty spot. Um, leadership qualities, so we expect our residents to become leaders. And this is a graduated process. So um, we expect our residents to day one start becoming leaders. And then as they advance through residency, and especially once you're chiefs, I think the chief residents here have so much autonomy and they really uh, are able to uh, show off those leadership skills. And so again, the end, the end result is that our graduates are leaders in the field and we wanna develop those qualities uh, throughout those seven years. Um, collegiality and friendship. So we do not tolerate any malignancy here. Um, I know a lot of other residencies can be very toxic. Um, it's a, you know, obviously residency is gonna be tough enough as it is, uh, but here it's very collegial. It's, you know, everyone's friends and family. Uh, and there's certainly no, no type of toxicity here. And finally, we really want all of our residents to be happy and to be satisfied, not just to be great neurosurgeons. And again, this is what makes Miami the best residency program in the country. There's a lot of programs that do a lot of cases. There's a lot of programs that have the research. There's a lot of programs that kind of produce leaders in the field. But how many um, of those programs really have residents that are happy and are satisfied? And I can tell you, that the residents here have an exceptional quality of life. Everyone works hard, but they play hard and they're all um, just have an excellent quality of life. So that's probably our number one goal is that we want our residents to not only be well-trained, but we wanna make sure that your seven years here are, are ones that you look back upon and that you truly are happy. Uh, and again, so, so just please join us. This is our faculty. I think everyone has my email. You guys all, um, all have Ingrid's email. Um, a lot of questions and answers have come through the queue, uh, but if anything comes up, you know, please email us anytime. This is, this is a very special place and we look forward to hopefully meeting you guys in the future. Uh, look forward to seeing all of your applications come the, come the fall. So again, thanks for your time and welcome and, and ask us questions.